God is trying to get you into heaven. He is not trying to keep you out. That's a very significant one. Very significant one. It reverses your whole understanding of what's going on. What's the other one? Jesus is the exact image of God in human flesh. The exact image. You see Jesus in the New Testament, you are watching God move. You are seeing God move. What's the last one? God is for us. Just a direct quote from Romans chapter 8. God is for us. And if God is for us, who can be against us? It, that is just such a great phrase to keep in your heart and your mind. If God is for us, who can be against us? That was a cool one, but that's not the one. That's the logo for my church, actually. Is this the one, the gentle healer? No. Oh, I just tried to pick the newest one. Yeah, well, if you pick that one, I don't know if I could preach that one. Um, there's one on John 3, Nicodemus. John 3, down, 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 there at the bottom, there you go. you you, you, you got to have the PowerPoint one. Okay, so last night we talked about John 4. We talked about the woman at the well, right? One of the things I want to talk to you about as we're talking about John, when you read the book of John, you have to know something about the book. It's different from the other Gospels. Have you noticed that? Yeah. The stories don't line up. Things aren't quite the same. John has a different purpose, and John is probably the last of the Gospels written. In fact, there are some scholars who believe John may be the last book of the New Testament written. Now, that gets argued about depending on who's talking about it. But its purpose is very significant for you to understand. John realizes that after he dies, the generations that come will no longer have eyewitnesses to the life of Christ. Okay? They will no, there will no longer be people around that they can just go to and ask about Jesus. And so John, when he starts writing his gospel, comes at it a little differently. It's not simply a biography. It's a theological biography. He's trying to prove certain theological points as he moves through the book. And then in these two chapters, John chapter 3 and John chapter 4, there's a big comparison being made. It's a comparison of the reach of the arms of God. From the very bottom, last night we talked about the woman at the well. She's a Samaritan, which puts her down on the ladder, right? She's a woman, which puts her down further on the ladder. She's had five husbands, and the man she's living with now in first century Israel is not her husband. That puts her down maybe off the ladder, okay? And she is as low as a person can go by description of the first century culture, okay? Now on the opposite end of that is John chapter 3, the story of Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a ruler in Israel. He's a member of the Sanhedrin. That's like... Um, the, uh, the Supreme Court justices, okay? So if a Supreme Court justice walked in here tonight, you'd be kind of impressed, right? Well, that's what Nicodemus is. Nicodemus is a Supreme Court justice. He's on the top rung of the ladder. So what John 3 and 4 are doing is showing the reach of Jesus' love. They're showing the reach of his ability to touch hearts, Okay? John is not haphazardly picking stories. He's picking stories for a reason. I told you last night, water keeps coming up in these first couple of chapters. It keeps popping up. Water, being born of the water of the Spirit. Having the water that you will thirst no more. Remember, the, the water keeps coming up. Tonight, watch for the word darkness. I'm going to point it out to you a couple of times because darkness becomes an important theme in the story of Nicodemus. Okay? All right? Remember that Nicodemus is the one to whom is said, that should be John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Okay? Nicodemus is the one to whom that is said. So as we start at the beginning, at the time that he is arriving, I want you to notice Nicodemus' arrival. There was a man of the Pharisees, and this actually is supposed to have black shadowing, not white shadowing behind him, but apparently it was lost in the translation from Apple to, uh, from, from Mac to PC. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. A ruler of the Jews is where you understand that he's a member of the Sanhedrin, okay? A ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus at night. Now first get the picture of your mind of what it was to be Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a big man on campus, Okay, Nicodemus is a significant guy. He is only mentioned in the book of John. Think about it for a sec. The last book written, the last gospel written, 
mentions the story of Nicodemus. If Nicodemus was a powerful man, if Nicodemus was a leader in first century Israel, it may have been that he didn't really want his story out there too much. So if you wait a few years, when it doesn't really matter as much, now Nicodemus can be publicized. Now Nicodemus' story can be put out there. Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night. Now imagine what it's like to leave the house that night. He's standing there in, the, in, in sort of that turmoil, that question, what should I do? Should I do this? Have you ever been there where you had to, you were trying to make up your mind to do something and just struggling, should I or should I not? Should I or should I not? And he finally just opens the front door. It's gotten dark enough now where he feels like, okay, I could leave the house. And so he opens the front door and he starts just slowly moving down the side of the house, kind of staying in the shadows not wanting to notice anybody else who's on the street. He's not seeking anybody's attention. He's kind of creeping along. Somehow he knows where Jesus hangs out. He's done some research. He's been paying attention. He knows where to find Jesus. He makes his way through the village, out of the village, and then he finds where Jesus is spending the night with his disciples. He goes there to speak to this man, but he goes there in the dark, okay? The New Living Translation actually says that. It says, he went to Jesus after dark. That theme of darkness. I want you to think about it for a second. He goes there when it's dark. John is displaying a difference here. Look at John chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. In Christ, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. So Jesus is going to see the light of the world at, or Nicodemus is going to see the light of the world at night in the dark, okay? And the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness did not comprehend it, okay? Nicodemus is sneaking out at night to see the light of the world. Is that a little ironic to you? You know, I don't think this irony is missed on John. I don't think John is accidentally saying this. He is finding this ironic as well, and so he's throwing it out there. Here's this guy who's the big cheese. He's the big ruler. He comes to find Jesus at night. Remember when the woman at the well found Jesus? The middle of the day, brightest part of the day. The woman who is darkest in her soul, according to Israel, finds the light of the world at the middle of the day. The man who is the ruler of Israel, the man who understands what it is to follow after God, sneaks out at night to find the light of the world. Rabbi. Now, we blow over rabbi pretty simply in the scriptures when we read it, but this is a big deal. When he calls him rabbi, he is actually calling him his master. This is a very, very respectful term. To call someone rabbi is to, to, see, to state that he is your master. He is your leader. He is above you. Now, what do you know about Jesus? Is he a real rabbi? No, no. He is a country bumpkin from up in Galilee. He's this backwoods storyteller from Galilee, and this ruler of the Jews opens the conversation with him by saying, Rabbi, Master. Okay? Nicodemus knows something about Jesus. Enough to at least have respect. Right? The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. To respect whom you're talking to. To respect that you are speaking to Jesus. Rabbi, we know. We. Does he have a mouse in his pocket? <laughs> That's what my mother would say. That's what my mother would ask me. Or when I would say, hey, we want to go outside. We who? You got a mouse in your pocket? We, we know. He's implying that there are other people who have been thinking about this. The we that he hangs around with is the Sanhedrin. The we that he spends his time with is the leadership of Israel. We know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. All right? So the miracles of Jesus have gotten out. They've been noised about. They have been demonstrated to be true. And so when Nicodemus comes, he says, well, we know that you must be from God because nobody does what you do on their own. Let me stop for a sec. If Jesus were just to have survived on the miracles, if Jesus were just to do everything, just I'll go around and I'll keep doing miracles to make people believe in me. Does that develop faith? I 
it. Right? It wouldn't, right? It would, because it's right in front of you. It's right in front of you all the time. You're not going to develop faith because you get to watch this powerful, miraculous stuff. So let me ask you a question. Is this a statement of faith? The other night we said the uninformed faith requires more faith. Nicodemus says, I believe, we believe that you are a teacher sent from God because of the miracles. Okay? Does it require faith to see a blind man given his sight, to see a dead person raised, and believe this guy must have some connection with God? Not so much. Not much at all. So this is not a big statement of faith. It's a statement of respect. Rabbi is very respectful. But it is not a big statement of faith. Okay? I want you to catch that because sometimes we, we hear this opening comment from Nicodemus and we think, wow, he's very much a man. He really believes in Jesus. No, he believes in the miracles. He believes in what Jesus has been doing. Okay? So Jesus, being Jesus, oh, my we is even off. See, well, there we go. Hopefully those, those little yellow circles won't be too far off because then they'll just be comical. Remember John's statement. Darkness does not comprehend the light when it sees it. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus replies, How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus comes and says, Rabbi, we know you're from God because of what you do. It's amazing. Jesus does what Jesus always does. Right? You ever get down on your knees beside your bed and you pray and say, Lord, please reveal to me what I'm supposed to do. And you get this odd-sounding response. And a lot of times you don't get any response, right? You're just like sitting there. But you get this weird thing sometimes. I was in my garage. When I first moved to my church, it was a church plant. And um, so the office was in my garage, okay? And the copier was in my living room and my wife was the secretary. So that's what church plants are like, okay? You don't have facilities, so you just crowd them all into the pastor's house. Okay, so I'm sitting in my office in the garage, okay, and we had been looking for a building. We were trying to find out if, we were trying to actually figure out if we should build, and one of my elders and I had been driving around town looking at land, knowing that the economy had dipped, this would be the time to do this if we could afford it at all. So we drove around town, and we drove around town, and we were, for two or three weeks, we drove around, and we stopped and looked at every piece of land that seemed it might be appropriately sized, okay, and they were just overpriced and overpriced and overpriced, and there was just nothing we could afford. We kept passing this one piece of property on the corner of Springview and Sunset. My friend, that my elder, lived down the street. And so we'd have to go buy it in order to go to and from his house. So whether I was picking him up or he was driving, we were always driving past this piece of property. Well, there was a sign out there. You know how the, the, those signs get dilapidated after a while? It was one of those big signs made out of a half a sheet of, of, of plywood. And it had broken on one side. You know, kids broke it, wind bro who knows why, but it was laying over like this. So one leg is broken, and this side is laying on the ground, and the other side's on its leg. It's got this cockeyed-looking sign. And so we were driving by, and we, and we, out of this sort of desperation, said, well, maybe that number on the sign is still valid. Let's call and see what they want for this piece of property. So we end up calling up this company to see what they want. Well, meanwhile... I'm in my office the day before, and I'm saying, Lord, this is getting a little frustrating. What should we be doing? Should we be buying land? Should we stop? What should we do? And I, I said, okay, here's what I want to know. And this I, I was very specific. I said, I want to know where we should build. I want to know how we're going to do it. I want to know when we should start. And I sat there for a second, and, I, and, and I, this, this really strong impression came you're asking too much. Oh, great, great. Thanks, I'm asking too much. So I stopped and I said, okay, what do I really need to know? And I said, okay, Lord, all I really need to know is when. Right? You can sort out everything else. If this is the time we should be looking for land, it, then, then this is the when. Let's, if this is now, then okay. So, all right, Lord, all I really need to know is when. And I sat there. And whereas the Lord had said, un, un, it, you know, do you have, I don't know. I know it creeps folks out sometimes when you say this, but I'm telling you, a voice inside your head that is not your own sometimes speaks. And either you need to go see a psychiatrist or God is speaking, okay? Now, 
Either one could be possible. So if you're hearing voices, you better just check that out really carefully. Check it against Scripture, okay? So I, I prayed the second time. Okay, I just need to know when. And the heavens were silent. Nothing. I'm thinking, hey, wait a second. Didn't you say I was asking too much? I've now got it down to one question. Nothing. So it was my pattern at that point that I would, I would do my prayers and I would actually be journaling prayer as I was going. So I actually have this written down in my journal, this is, which is awesome because I have this, this journal from 1994 where this was all happening. And so I finished my journal with, okay, I guess nothing is going to come from this. And so in the top of my journal on the next page, so I have a prayer page and then I have a scripture page. On the next page, I had written the scripture for the next day because I, I, that's how I keep track of where I am because I can't remember from one day to the next. So I just wrote, wrote the scripture in the top. And so I looked at it. I opened to that passage. And the passage said, you may remember this passage, now is the day of salvation. <laughs> Isn't that cool? And now I'm looking at the Bible going, hmm. <laughs> and so for you to see my notes, my next note is, is this the answer? <laughs> when you speak to the heavens and the heavens respond, sometimes it's not the answer you want. We've been talking a lot about answered prayer and praying for people and how God impacts life when you pray. There's a great country song. I don't remember exactly what the title is, but the gist of the song is the best things that happened to me were unanswered prayers. Sometimes no is the best possible answer. You just don't understand it at the time. Okay? So here's Nicodemus. He's come to Jesus, and remember, interactions with Jesus are kind of like praying. He's come to Jesus, and he has this big intro you know, I love his intro because it's almost like some of the intros you hear in church prayers, right? A person goes into a church prayer, and they have this big intro. Clearly, they've written it, and clearly, it's been practiced. O oh, thou creator of the heavens and the earth, thou who is beyond all mankind. And they go through this, this big intro. And then most of the time, you have a letdown after the intro because they get into actually talking to God, and they have nothing left to say. He comes and he has this big intro, Rabbi, da 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 And Jesus says, let's cut to the chase. The issue for you, my friend, is that you must be born again, or you will not see the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus, like the woman at the well, goes directly for the practical argument. He says, how's that going to happen? What do you mean, be born again? Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom. So he's repeating himself, right? He's just making a little clarification. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Paul will take this theology and he will work it and 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 work it through the rest of his writings. Being born of the flesh or being born of the spirit. Should Nicodemus know what Jesus is talking about? But what Jesus will say that to him. The concept of being born again should not be a new idea to him, okay? The Jewish people already say this about a proselyte. You know what a proselyte is? A proselyte is a non-Jew being converted to Judaism. It's a Gentile being converted to Judaism, okay? So they already say this of proselytes. They say that they are born again when they are baptized, okay? So what is the problem with this ruler of the Jews being told that he might need to be born again? He's not a Gentile. That's what you do for Gentiles. Yeah, baptize the woman at the well. She needs it. I am a member of the Sanhedrin. That's something that you only talk about when you're talking about those people, right? But it should have been clear in his mind. Secondly, the Greeks in the mystery religions also spoke of this same injury, imagery, being born again. This should not have been news to Nicodemus. This concept should have been clear to him, and maybe more significantly for us, about 60, 70 years later, should have been clear to John's audience as well. Okay? The idea of being born again was clear in the communication. It's less clear to us than it was to them. Okay? It's something we have had to learn and teach theologically. It's something we have had to talk to, about and learn. And when people say this, it always freaks Adventists out just a little bit. Can I do a little inside baseball with us? 
when somebody says to you, I've been born again, does it just kind of make you, mm, right? A lot of folks in the Adventist church just aren't comfortable with those words. Oh, I was born again. Okay, good for you. Good for you, right? Aren't, it, it's a very solid biblical concept. You are free to use the idea yourself. When somebody says, do you know Jesus? It's okay to say, yes, I have been born again. Okay? It, what it means is you've gotten a fresh start. You've gotten, you've gotten to start over. Spiritual birth. This is one of the great things. When, I, you're probably all baptized. When I baptize someone, I always ask the same question. Is there a day that you'd like to be baptized on that would be meaningful to you? Okay? Birthday, anniversary, um, Christmas. I don't care. Pick a day that would be meaningful to you. I've done some baptisms. I did a baptism on a Wednesday because it was a significant day, anniversary day for this family. So, okay, we'll get some people together. And we'll do, the Bible does not say the whole church has to be present for a baptism, right? So we got some folks together, and we did a baptism on a Wednesday because the day would be memorable for the person who was baptized the day they were born again, their new birthday. So they were not going to forget, I was baptized in 1975, I don't remember, I had sometime in the summer. Man. Do you know your birthday? When somebody says, what day were you born on? You say, yeah, yeah, I was born on June 3, 1961. Awesome, best day of my mother's life. <laughs> I'm the only son. One shot at this. So I send my mother a congratulatory card on my birthday. <laughs> Not really, just kidding. But you should be looking at those. If you can't remember your baptismal date, go back, look at your baptismal certificate, write that thing down, begin to memorize it, because it is your birthday. It's your spiritual birthday, born again. He also told them that he had to be born of the water and born of the Spirit. To be born of the water is an interesting idea, because the Jewish rabbis actually taught that babies were made out of water in their mother's womb. Now think about it. What comes out with the baby? water logical conclusion how do we get the baby don't know water came out must have come from the water so you can tell your kids next when your little kids ask yeah well water comes out must be made from the water it's what the rabbis taught tell them about the biology later so being born of the water may simply mean birth however if Nicodemus witnessed John's baptism, it may indicate baptism for a Jewish man as well. He may have understood that we were talking about baptism. Proselytes, being born again, or being baptized. John's going around baptizing a bunch of Jewish people, right? He may have already understood that this born of the water business was about baptism. But remember, it applies to those people. It doesn't apply to him, okay? Okay. John 1, verse 19 to 27, John is reporting on what he's doing. Look at this. This was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders sent priests and temple assistants from Jerusalem to ask John, who are you? Who are the Jewish leaders? The Sanhedrin. Who sent these guys to talk to John about what he was doing? Nicodemus and his friends. The we, these guys. So they asked John what he was doing. Who are you? He came right out, and, right out and said, I'm not the Messiah. Well, then, who are you, they asked. Are you Elijah? Nope, he replied. Are you the prophet we were expecting? No. So do you get the idea that at the first century they were expecting Jesus? Absolutely. The charts weren't all exact, but all the charts pointed to this general time, okay? So they were expecting Jesus. Then who are you? We need an answer for those who sent us. What do you have to say about yourself? <clears throat> John replied in the words of the prophet Isaiah, I am the voice shouting in the wilderness, clear the way for the Lord is coming. It's Isaiah 40, verse 3. 
He says, I am the one who's preparing the way for the Lord. He's saying, I am the one making way for the Messiah. I'm not the Messiah. I'm the one making way for the Messiah. When the Pharisees who had been, who had been sent asked him, if you aren't the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet, what right do you have to baptize? What are you doing out here baptizing people if you're not who we're looking for? Now, he told them who he was. He had told them that he was the prophet sent from God to prepare for the Messiah. But since he didn't fit the process, the picture that they had in mind, they were going to reject him. Now, can I just throw up a, a, a quick sideline? In our church, we have a tendency to, to, to make a lot of charts about everything that's going to happen. Okay? From, from Revelation chapter 13 on, people take, their, take their, their Bibles and they read through them and they read the Old Testament and the New Testament and they go, this is going to happen then and then this is going to happen then and then this is going to happen then and, and they get this chart all worked out. You know what scares me about those charts other than the fact that none of them are the same? That somebody's going to be sitting there at the end of time when the things are winding up, looking at their chart saying, no, this can't be Jesus because he doesn't match my chart. That scares me. That worries me about us. It worries me about anyone who makes charts. In 30 years of ministry, I've seen a lot of charts. And I'm telling you, none of them are the same unless they were duplicated and handed out. Because we are projecting into a future we cannot know because we are not prophets. Okay? These guys didn't recognize John the Baptist because he didn't fit the model. Think about it. He's this weird guy eating locusts and, and, and honey. He's kind of scraggly looking. He's wearing camel's hair, which, by the way, probably itched. And he's baptizing Jews. You don't baptize Jews. You baptize Gentiles. John told him, I baptize with water, but right here in this crowd is someone you do not recognize. Though his ministry follows mine, I am not even worthy to be his slave and untie the straps of his sandals. He said, I am preparing the way for the Messiah. And guess what? He's right behind me. The point is they should have understood the idea of baptism. In chapter 4, when we start the story of why Jesus is leaving Judea, look at how it starts. Therefore, when the Lord, the, therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, he left Judea. There's a lot of baptizing going on. When he says you must be born of the water and of the spirit, if he is missing this, he's got his head in a hole somewhere because there's no way he should be misunderstanding what Jesus is saying to him. Therefore, the, Pharisee, when the, therefore the Lord, when he knew that the Pharisees had heard, who are the people who are standing there talking to John? The Pharisees. Who sent them? The leaders of the Jews. Now, the back to the born of the Spirit part. Look at chapter 1 again. As many as received him, who is the him? Jesus. To them he gave the right to become children of God, those who believe in his name, who were born not of the blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. See, John has been laying out a picture for us that we should be getting what's happening when we see the story of Nicodemus. He tells him, the pneuma, the wind, blows where it wishes, and so it is with everyone born of the pneuma or the spirit. The pneuma is just the word that means wind or spirit. So he says the, the wind or the spirit blows wherever it wishes, and those who are moved by the spirit are moved on just like the wind moves on things. Our good man, Nicodemus, says, how can this be? Now, if he knew about proselytes being born again and being born of the water, and he knew about the baptisms that were going on around him, this is a question either of intentional ignorance or just plain ignorance. Jesus treats it as if it's intentional ignorance. We speak of what we know and testify what we have seen in conversations that people have with Jesus in the New Testament. I've come to talk to you, to learn about you. If you think about it, when Nicodemus shows up, the response for this, this backwater rabbi from Galilee should be, whoa, look, Nicodemus just came into camp. Oh, somebody get him some hot cocoa. Oh, would you like to sit here? This is my seat, right? Oh, you're such an honored guest. Oh, we're so glad to have you. Oh, 
And he's not taking any of that. He's not bowing to Nicodemus' status at all. In fact, he's having a very tough conversation with this guy because unlike the woman at the well, Nicodemus should know. Remember we talked about the wicked woman at the well and the posture Jesus took with her? He took a very, very soft posture with her. He sat wearily by, beside the well. He opened the conversation with her by saying, please get me some water. Everything was handed to her. All the authority, all the power for that conversation was handed to her. Now when he's dealing with a ruler, somebody who should know, he deals with him much more directly, much more straight. Does that scare you at all? Wouldn't you rather have him being kind and gentle and soft with you? You know why he's being so straight with Nicodemus? Because this is the guy who should already understand, and this is the way Nicodemus talks. This is a conversation between a couple of people who are strong in their understanding. This is the way rabbinic and leadership people in that age talked to each other. Very direct, confrontational, back and forth. Okay? This is not an unusual way for him to be talking. Chapter 3, verses 12 to 13. If I have told you earthly things, and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? So here's what, here's what was being set up. Nicodemus, you should understand that you have to be born again if you're going to see the kingdom. Yeah, 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 not possible. How can an old man be crawling back into the womb and be born again? Listen, you should already understand this, Nicodemus. You should already know what it means to be born of the water and born of the Spirit. The wind blows wherever it wants, and so it is with the Spirit. You should get this, Nicodemus. Nicodemus is not getting it. He's saying, no, that's hard to understand. No, no. Jesus said, how, if I can talk to you about earthly things, are you going to understand anything when I talk to you about heavenly things? Now he's getting to the sermon in chapter 3. He says, I have some heavenly things to talk to you about, Nicodemus. I have some things that are direct from God to talk to you about. Here's where I think Nicodemus starts to listen. Before this, Nicodemus is arguing. At this point, I think Nicodemus starts to listen. Do you remember what he says? This next few verses are some of the most powerful verses, summary of what God's intentions are for mankind in the New Testament. And they're spoken to a guy who has snuck out at night to talk to this rabbi he doesn't want anybody to know he's talking to. You know the grace in this to me? You know the great grace in this to me? Is that he didn't send Nicodemus packing. Oh, big dude Nicodemus, great. You show up at night, come back tomorrow when it's daylight. I'll, I'll be happy to talk to you tomorrow in the center square in the daylight. You're ashamed of me? I don't want to talk to you. Isn't that how humans deal with it? Isn't that what we would do? I can't believe you're coming here at night. You're ashamed to be seen talking to me. If you were dating a girl and you would only meet her at night, <laughs> how's that going to go over? Well, I don't really need anybody to actually know that we're, you know, we're talking. We're dating. I don't want anybody to actually know that you're my girlfriend. Nicodemus shows up at night because he's ashamed of Jesus. He's intrigued by Jesus. He's interested in Jesus, but he doesn't want anybody to know he's talking to him. And after this conversation, this back and forth, Jesus is about to lay on him the, the most succinct, direct, clear presentation of the gospel he lays on anybody in the middle of the night of a guy who's ashamed to be standing there talking to him. He says, Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Even so, the Son of Man must be lifted up. So that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. The first thing he does is goes back to Moses and he brings forth an image and he says, you remember that bronze serpent? Do you remember the story? Israel is rebelling against God again. And a bunch of snakes come into the camp. And Moses makes a serpent out of bronze and he puts it up on a pole. And if they will, this is, well, this is crazy. If they will just look at the serpent on the pole, they will not be affected by the vipers who are biting them and people still died. Think how stubborn you have to be to do that. Snakes are biting you. Snakes are coming into the camp killing people and you refuse to look at a snake on a pole. Moses said, look at the snake and you'll live. And people died. It's a great metaphor for the end of time. Look unto Jesus and live. Why would anyone be lost? 
Why would anyone be lost? And this is the passage. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. This guy sneaked out of the house, creeped around the town, stayed in the shadows, finally shows up to Jesus to talk to him, to have a little confrontational conversation. And Jesus gives him the best summary in Scripture about what he's doing. This is the passage every kindergarten kid learns. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son because he was trying to get Nicodemus into heaven. Don't be mistaken by the tenor of the conversation. Don't be mistaken by the back and forth. This is God's heart reaching out to Nicodemus and trying to draw him into a relationship that will be salvific in nature, that will see him saved in the end. Nicodemus, God loves you, and I am here. I am here as an offering. I am here to be lifted up. I am here as a sacrifice so that you, if you will believe in me, will have eternal life. God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Everybody knows 316. Not that many know 317. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. You know why? Because God is for us. He didn't need to send anybody condemn, to condemn us. He didn't send anybody to condemn us. He sent a rescue party. He sent a savior. Not a lawyer and not a judge. A savior. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe in him has been judged already. Because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. Now think about our man Nicodemus knows about the serpent on the pole, and he knows how ridiculous it is that anybody died. He knows that all they had to do was look to the look to the serpent, look to the image on the pole, look at it, and live. And Jesus said, I'm going to be lifted up like that. And he's saying, if you will believe in me, just look and live. Just believe and live. If you refuse, the condemnation is in the refusal, not in my presence. Some of us are a little afraid of Jesus because we're afraid that, that somehow he has an agenda that's going to be condemning. It's not the sake. It's not the situation. He said, I've come. I didn't come to judge you. I didn't come to condemn you. I came to rescue you. I came to get you out of this. I came to get you away from the world. Look and live. I want, I want to stop a, a second and say we've been, we've been spending some time talking about prayer and talking about the church and talking about other things. But let's, let's, let's talk about this issue for a sec. If your relationship with Jesus is not connected, if, if you have not said, I am absolutely in, I have decided not to follow after my sins anymore, I've decided to follow Jesus. If you haven't made that straight, don't leave the room tonight without doing it. If you've come here tonight and you, are, you just were dragged here by your husband or your wife and you're sitting here saying, I wish this guy would just shut up and get done, deal with this before you go. Because it is just as serious as the serpent in the wilderness. Vipers are coming into the camp and he puts this thing on the pole and he says, look at this and you'll be okay. And people died because they refused to look. Jesus says, that's what the metaphor is. That's what best fits the picture for me. Look, I will be hung on the cross. I will be put up like that snake on that pole. And I have come as a sacrifice. I have come as an offering. I have come as a rescuer. Look at me and live. That offer is still open today. It is still open to everyone in this room. It is still open to us. If you haven't done this, do this. Say to him, I have chosen to follow you. I have chosen to surrender myself, and I need your forgiveness of my sin. Done. And then wake up tomorrow morning and just follow. You wake up tomorrow morning and say, okay, where are we going? And go. It is an adventurous life to follow Jesus. Do you realize there were people all over the all over the, uh, around Galilee who lived there, floated around in boats, hung out in the lake all day long, but only one guy ever walked on it, besides Jesus himself. One day Jesus is standing there on the water. He says, "Lord, if it's you, call me out." Which is a crazy statement, by the way. 
If it's actually you, call me to come walking on the water. What if it's not? <laughs> you didn't think about that, did you? Peter apparently didn't either. But the, only the follower of Jesus got to walk on the water. You want to talk about a story to tell your grandchildren? It's more exciting to follow Jesus than to go off in your own path. And it leads to heaven in the end. It's, all, it's amazing. The people who refuse to, to, to follow Jesus are judged by the refusal. Because there's only one way to salvation. There aren't two options. There aren't three or four or 19 options. There's one way. There's one God. There's one Savior, Jesus Christ, period. Only thing. You know, we have, these, we have these three angels, and we complicate our conversation about them. I was telling Pastor Gary earlier this week, I have been learning from teaching little kids Bible studies. My early, my early ministry, I was a youth pastor for years. I never really gave many Bible studies to little kids. I did early teen camp meeting for 23 years, so I talked to a lot of them. But I never gave many Bible studies. It seems like in recent years, God has said, okay, this is the season when you give Bible studies to 9, 10, and 11-year-olds. It's like, okay, God, that's what we're about now. That's what we're about. But what's amazing is what I'm learning from them. All kinds of interesting things about their family and everything else. But I mean about the Bible. <laughs> you should sit with your kids when they're taking Bible studies. You might want to stop them every once in a while. <laughs> but I was sitting with an 11-year-old girl. We're in a coffee shop because it was the only place her mother could find to meet us. And so we're sitting in this coffee shop, and I'm at the, I'm at the presentation of the three angels' message. And I'm thinking, what am I going to tell this 11-year-old that's going to make any sense to her about the three angels' message? And she wasn't a great Bible student. You know, you come across some kids who are really good Bible students, you just lay them on them like you lay it into, onto an adult because they get it. She wasn't such a good Bible student. So I thought, oh, man, how am I going to tell her about this? And in the, in the moment, I, I, I believe in those moments the Holy Spirit moves, okay, and gives you, gives you words that you don't normally have. And this is what I said to her. I said, okay, these three angels fly out in Revelation chapter 14. They're real significant because they're, they're sharing a message for the end of time. And it's really where we find kind of our home base as Adventists. You know, I kind of gave her that sort of lead in to why this was an important thing I was about to tell her. And I said, the first angel flies out. And you know what he says? He says, the gospel is still available. It's still available for you to follow Jesus. The gospel to the whole world. He says, it's still okay. You can still get in. It's not too late. The second angel flies out and he says, every other method people have been trying to be saved doesn't work. Not pretty simple. It doesn't work. No matter what you've been trying, no matter what it is, there's only one way and that's Jesus. The other ones don't work. And the third angel just says, and it's going to get ugly if you don't. And chapter four, the rest of 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19 prove that it's going to get ugly. Okay? And I believe those passages are there just so that we will understand the gravity of the decision being made in chapter 14. See, that's what Jesus is doing here. He's telling Nicodemus, you got to be born again, buddy, because I'm trying to get you into heaven, not keep you out. You've you, you got to be born again, Nicodemus. You've got to understand that I came to be your sacrifice. I came to be your rescuer. And if you refuse what I'm offering you, you will not be saved. You will be lost. And being lost is bad, bad news for you. There are not other ways to get this done. You can't be good enough to get in. Nobody walks through the pearly gates, turns to their friends and says, I got here the old-fashioned way. I earned it. Doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. Everybody gets there the same way, on the merits, the blood of Jesus. And to refuse the blood of Jesus is to refuse the only option. If you have a friend who needs to understand this. Read them these few verses. But don't get all carried away with, oh, look out for the judgment that's to come. Recognize that the judgment is simply a matter of not accepting the way out. It's like we're all lined up in, a, in an airplane that's going down, and we're up high enough for everybody to get out, and they're passing out parachutes at the door. And some folks are saying, no, nah, I don't want a parachute. I'll just go down with the plane. It's unnecessary that anybody be lost. It's unnecessary that anyone be lost because the sacrifice of Jesus is big enough to cover Nicodemus 
And we're going to dwell. One preacher said from the uttermost to the guttermost. From the, from the person who knows to the person who knows nothing. Because it isn't about what they know. It's about who they know. It's always been about who they know. When John is trying to explain how salvation works, he tries to help us understand that the judgment is because we've rejected the light and preferred the darkness. He comes back to the light came into the world and men chose the darkness over the light. And that's why they were lost. We're going to talk later this week about what I believe is how the end happened. And I think it's comes, it comes straight out of the sanctuary system. And it's as clear to me as day, right out of the sanctuary. But tonight, I just want to make it clear that there's only one way. And that's Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the heart and the effort of John in recording this for us. But thank you more that you sent your son that anyone who believes might have eternal life. Lord, tonight I re-accept, reaffirm my belief that you are the only option to get off of this whole planet alive. That your sacrifice was for me. Thank you for covering my sins. Thank you for giving me your grace. Thank you for the gift that is salvation. I choose it tonight, along with my brothers and sisters here. Thank you. We pray it in your name.